If you ride a bicycle a lot, you've probably had to put up with a lot of terrible road closures in your time. Therefore, I thought it was worth looking at a road closure permit that's been published by the City of Sydney. And the reason I'm putting this out there is I think we should be hassling every single council in Sydney to beg, borrow or steal this particular document from the City of Sydney and adopt it as their own. So we start by going to the construction permits and approvals page and if we scroll down to the bottom there's get approval to use the public way for minor construction works and this is where uh, you might need to temporarily close a footpath, cycleway or, or roadway. Uh, you know, a small job I guess. Now. Uh, you click on that and uh, you know it takes you to uh, you know, this page where it tells you it's going to take them at least two days to process the uh, application and it's going to cost you at least $95. Uh, $95 just to process it and then it can cost you a lot more depending on how many lanes of the road you need to close. So, uh, and it gives you all the different type of work activities that might be involved in a temporary closure. So what do they need to do? Uh, okay, acquire a, a traffic or pedestrian control plan drawn up by an RMS accredited person that's in accordance with Australian Standard 1742.3 and the Manual for Traffic Control at Work Sites. Uh, so this is like an Austroads document which uh, you know, has been published for some time and in order to be able to uh, follow that document and draw up uh, traffic control plans, you've got to do a course, you've got to get credited, all that kind of stuff. So you, you can't just have some Wally like me, um, you know, read the Austroads guide and then draw up a plan and submit it. You've got to have someone that's qualified and certified to do it. So in theory, they should really know what they're doing. They should know the Austroads guide backwards and they should have a lot of experience with traffic control. Now, if those works then impact on a cycleway at shared or shared path, you got to read the traffic control plan that's been published by the City of Sydney and this guide shows how to achieve an equivalent provision for people riding bikes in your traffic control plan. So they're saying very much that yeah you can close the road, you can close the cycleway, but you need to treat cyclists in exactly the same way that you're treating drivers. You need to make equivalent provision for them. You can't just close the road and put in a really good diversion for drivers and then cyclists can you know go to buggery. Now the traffic control plan guide is only two pages long and I've chopped it up into four chunks to make it easier to read through. And it starts off by saying, yeah, look, there's this basic uh, Austroads or RMS traffic control guide, um, you know, to, to make a worksite safe. But this, um, this guide that's been published by the City of Sydney goes above and beyond what the Austroads guides do because the Austroads guides are really quite deficient in managing cyclists. I mean, they, they did a, an improvement a year or so ago, and that was a big step forward. But it's like stepping from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. You know, they've still got quite a bit of... <laughs> they've got a few more steps to go, I think, to get to the Information Age. But, you know, they're, they're going to get there, I guess, in the end. So, you know, if it's on a high-traffic street or a high-volume cycleway, then they want to have a really good uh, diversion set up. So, uh, what they've got here is the outer barrier against the traffic has to be water-filled barriers. And you might have seen in some recent diversions around the inner west that that's, that has actually been set up. Councils have started specifying water-filled barriers where cyclists get pushed out onto the road. Um, and cyclists, you know, you need to divert both, tra both directions of bicycle traffic into a protected area of the road with water-filled barrier separation using a, a parking lane or a traffic lane. You may need to remove the far side parking lane or divert motor traffic to create space. Um, now this is important because they're saying, yeah, we don't care if you move, remove parking on both sides of the road for the duration of this in order to create a safe diversion through here. Uh, use a safe driveway, driveway or curb ramp with no lips for entry or exit. And you know, that's important. I mean, how many people are just about come to grief hitting a lip on a, uh, on a driveway because it's, you know, it's just too big, particularly if you're hitting it at an angle of, say, 45 degrees. Ensure it works in both directions, is well signed, and the surface is smooth and clean. I mean, God, I, I think they could have gone a bit further and say you must sweep the surface to ensure it's smooth and clean. And, you know, ensuring it works in both directions, I would have actually specified here uh, you got to ride through on a bike in both directions. You know, that's how you ensure it works. 
but okay, you know, if they haven't done that, I think we can live with that. And then they've got some, you know, minimum widths there. On a low traffic street, it's not as onerous. Instead of using water-filled barriers, they can just set up some cones and that's fine. But notice they've got uh, traffic controllers all over the place in, in both these setups. And, you know, for a low traffic street, this only works with traffic controllers present and is not to be left overnight. So you might be doing work over a number of days and you, you close the site at, you know, 5 p.m. and everyone goes home, fine. You have to take all the cones out and open up the cycleway to traffic again. Um, uh, let's see, so, you know, there's a bit more stuff here that's, that's kind of quite useful. Um, uh, which I think we can skip over. Um, so kind of things to consider, volume of bike riders, pedestrians and traffic and whether uh, bike flow is even in both directions or tidal. I mean, if you look at something like Lilyfield Road, for instance, you know, it's definitely tidal uh, you know, quite substantially with a morning peak going into the city and the evening peak going uh, back out to the suburbs. Uh, you know, peak times can be different for different people, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon around schools, um, you know, 7 a.m. on weekday morning, weekend, weekday mornings, I guess. Uh, lighting should be at least as good as the normal path or, or route. Slopes will affect speeds, uh, and that's all good. I really like this bit at the end, though, the thing that they're not allowed to do. So, uh, they can't just set up a detour where they send cyclists and pedestrians, often in the never-never, around the suburb. Uh, adding distance and time has more impact on people walking and riding than on drivers. Try to give people the most direct option, people being cyclists and pedestrians. Divert cars instead. I mean, far out. I mean, that is that is such a massive change in thinking for a lot of these detours that, uh, you know, it's easy for a driver. You just turn the wheel, put your foot down and, you know, no effort expended. It might take another you know, minute or two, but it's not the end of the world. Cyclists dismount, not allowed. Uh, dismount can mean extra risk, especially if someone is carrying a child on the bike or is wearing cleats. Thumbs up for that. I mean, that is just so good to say, forget about dismounting. It has to be rideable. I mean, sure, you might have to stop at, at traffic controllers. You know, that's fine. But no one's getting off their bike. And uh, merging is just, you know, forget about that as well. Uh, you know, a cycleway or shared path is protected from traffic might be used by children or, or new riders not confident in traffic. Yes, absolutely true. Uh, even reducing road width or narrowing the shoulder results in increased difficulty and risk. So, you know, excellent. They've considered uh, cyclists, I guess, of all ages and all abilities and how this could impact on them. And you need to come up with something which is going to be suitable, I guess, for non-confident eight-year-old cyclists or, you know, or think of, for instance, uh, you know, a, a young family, you've got, you got mum and dad, and they might have uh, you know, a kid that's eight years old on a bicycle, and then they might have a young child in a seat um, behind one of the parents. You, know, you see that kind of thing going around in the inner west. How do you cater for those people who have got kids or are carrying kids? This guide, I think, takes care of that quite nicely. And remember, barrier boards and signs should not be placed such that they force cyclists away from space allocated to cyclists. Do not place roadwork signs so they block cycleways. I mean, how many times have we seen that? I mean, it was just rife on the Lilyfield Road, Lilyfield Road for a long time, where you know, all the roadworks would be going on and they'd just whack their, their control signs right in the middle of the cycle lane and block half of it or, or two thirds of it. And look, that's actually totally against the Ostroad standards and the RMS traffic control worksite standard. You know, they're just not allowed to do that. And really, you know, any uh, any site that does that, it's obviously breaching this and they should be reported to council or the RMS and, you know, a request made for someone to come out and inspect the site and pull them up and get them to do it properly. Anyway, like I said at the beginning, I think this is a really good document. It's a nice addendum, I guess, to the Ostroads guides, which uh, all traffic controllers are, should now be used to using. And I think we should just quietly campaign with, uh, you know, the councils around Sydney to say, you know, can you adopt this? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty simple um, and it could make a very, very big difference.